worked in Southeast Turkey, um, a site I talked about a little bit uh, at the beginning of the semester, a site called Hebrew Merdon Tepe on the Tigris um, River. One of the interesting things that we learned from looking at the animal bone remains uh, was that the climate and the landscape 4,000 years ago when the site was inhabited was very different than it w is today. Many people look at the landscape of an area and they just kind of assume that in ancient times it looked like that. Not so. Um, this is the site that we worked on. This is kind of the area around the site. And you can see there's really almost no trees whatsoever. And you don't see many wild animals. The only animals in the area are domesticated sheep uh, and goat. But when we looked at the animal bones recovered from the site, what we found, uh, and here you can see the genus and species. This is pig, domesticated pig, domesticated cattle. Uh, these are sheep and goat, but game animals, including deer, were actually a pretty large percentage uh, of the total animal bones that were recovered from the site, including antlers like these that were recovered. And you can see these are shed antlers, not antlers that were cut off uh, of a deer skull. But what this means is that there were a lot of deer in the area, uh, and there were also woods where the deer lived. The deer don't roam around uh, a landscape like this. They, they live in forested areas, as we all know, uh, which means that 4,000 years ago, there were forests on these hills and there were deer in the forest. Most likely, or you know, the most likely thing is that people cut down those trees and those trees never grew back. Uh, people probably deforested that area. Um, but deer used to be an important resource 4,000 years ago in this area. And that's something that you're only going to, that's the kind of information you're only going to get from archaeological remains. Uh, also, shellfish will uh, have incremental growth structures. We talked a little bit about this when we talked about climate again, like tree rings, right? uh, a certain you know, amount, a new essentially kind of ring will grow on uh, a shellfish like a, a scallop or, or, a, or an oyster. And when you recover these and you see at when the shellfish was processed, was it processed before the, um, the, the, that ring was added or after it was added? You can tell the time of the year that people were harvesting this shellfish. Let's take a look at an example from North America of how zooarchaeology can help us sort of understand what was going on uh, and help us understand the process from the very earliest settlement in North America around 12,000 years ago or earlier, uh, you know, up until fairly recently. Uh, okay, so when North America was first settled by people who were migrating across from essentially Siberia, the earliest uh, Native Americans, um, North America had large megafauna, uh, mastodon, woolly mammoth. You still find these bones in, in West Michigan. Occasionally it makes the news when, you know, the um, remains of a woolly mammoth or a mastodon are found, you know, in, in Grand Rapids or, or, or nearby. Um, and after this period, the climate started to warm up and get uh, warmer and weather. And this is known as the Archaic uh, period. So we're going to take a look at one particular site and what it, it can tell us about the Archaic period. Right? Uh, during this time period, people were hunting and gathering, uh, just like they were all over the world. One of the things that you're going to do in your exercise is you're going to reconstruct seasonality or when people are living at different sites. And that's going to give you an idea uh, in, uh, to sort of understand what kind of hunting and gathering people were conducting. Because there's actually several different kinds of hunting and gathering. The most common type that we're you know, used to or the one that we you know, hear about in many classes is what's known as foraging or mobile hunting and gathering. In foraging, people move to resources. They move their campsite and they go where resources appear. Uh, you know, people like the, the Kong in South Africa are foragers. So they kind of map their movements onto when uh, different foods are available. This is different from collectors. 
collectors are uh, sedentary hunters and gatherers. They move food to people. So foragers move people to food and collectors move food to people. Collectors usually stay in one spot. That's their big home base, but then they'll have uh, temporary campsites outside of the home base in different areas where they extract food, maybe hunt, collect certain things, bring it back to their home base. So let's look at a, a site in North America that tells us a lot about the movement from forging to collecting in ancient North America during this what's known as the Archaic period and the site is called Coster named after the family that owned the land for, on which the site exists it's down in southern Illinois it's it turned out to be a very important site because it's one of the best sites to study the archaic in North America um, archaeologists start to work there on the Coster's farmland and as they started to dig on the farm here you can see the Coster family they found that the layers of occupation went back 7,000 years. So in one area, they essentially had a good time capsule of life in this area over 7,000 years. And you can see how deep these levels went. And so we're going to look at sort of a snapshot of the different levels uh, and how archaeologists determine the way life uh, worked at that time and what it tells us about ancient North America. Coster was, uh, is an interesting site for many reasons. It was one of the first sites where flotation was developed, where the main archaeologists uh, developed a technique to uh, take soil from good archaeological context, put it into a barrel of water, and allow the seeds and other plant remains to float to the surface, extract those, and then use them for uh, study and analysis. They also found, as you can see here, a puppy burial, uh, a puppy that was buried with uh, a person or nearby a person, which shows the kind of close connection that people had at this time with their animals. So, in Coster, there were about 13 levels. You're not going to have to remember every single level and the time period, but we're really going to just kind of look at the different levels, but think about the big picture, what happens over time. So the earliest levels are around the, the time of the megafauna, 9,500 BC. Um, you get to Horizon 13, it's a little bit after. This is the time when things were beginning to warm up. Go a little bit later in time, about 6,400 BC, and what they found was a small village of about 25 people. Um, it was seasonal. That is, the uh, plant remains, the animal remains, indicate that people were not living there all year round. They were only living there at certain times of the year. So, for example, imagine that you were digging up. Imagine, let's say, the Grand Valley campus was abandoned, and archaeologists in the future are excavating an area of the Grand Valley campus. And it's, it turns out to be, let's say, student housing. And it's a student apartment. And what they find is that there's uh, some corn. Um, well, actually, there's no corn. What they find is that uh, there's some squash, some pumpkin seeds. Uh, maybe they find some apples and some, and some fruit. But they don't find, let's say, cherry pits. They don't find corn. What they would uh, learn from that is that those students lived in that apartment in the fall when those things like squash and pumpkins are available, but did not live there in the summer when you would find things like cherries and corn, which appear during that time of the year. And so archaeologists would say, oh, this uh, student apartment was only occupied in the fall, not occupied in the summer, which, you know, to us would make sense because we would say, oh, well, you know, they weren't taking summer classes and they live somewhere else during the summer. So that's how it would work in some of these archaeological sites. So in this uh, area, they found, again, a seasonal occupation. They found hearths. They found uh, technology for grinding uh, nuts and other vegetables. So the megafauna had disappeared by this time. Uh, they were either hunted out of existence or they couldn't deal with the warming temperatures. And instead, what people had were forests filled with 
deer and other kinds of wildlife, uh, streams and rivers teeming with fish and other kinds and also plants along the riverside that were edible. So a lot of uh, really nutritious food locally available at this time. So people were eating acorns and nuts, uh, fish, you know, medium-sized mammals, and it was a very healthy lifestyle at this time period. They also found from this time period tools like the ads. The ads is like an axe, but it's oriented differently. And it'd be used to, let's say, uh, dig out a tree trunk in order to make a canoe. Uh, this is also the time period that you find these dog burials. This, was a, this dog was about 18 months old. It was covered with red ochre, which is a red mineral. And, you know, and that shows not only a close connection between humans and their animals, but also some reverence. Uh, because they're actually burying it like they, they would a person. Get to the next period, around 5,600 BC to about 5,000 BC. And what we start to see is, not surprisingly, because there's more food locally available, more food, more people. The population starts to increase. This is, the at this point, the earliest permanent houses in North America. We see houses that... Um, were built to essentially be permanent structures. We find post molds for the posts that held up the, uh, the, ha the roofs. And we also, from the animals and the plants, we can tell that people lived in the village all year round. So they're living there all year round and they're building houses to survive the entire year. In the next period, right, again, they're living in this village you know, for almost a thousand years, they're sedentary. They've now become collectors, no longer foragers. They live permanently in a village. They start uh, collecting foods around them and bringing them back to their home, home base. Fish, ducks, geese, hickory nuts, cereal, like marsh elder and goosefoot, which is found along the rivers. And now the village is about 150 people. Uh, people lived until their 60s and 70s in this village. So quite a healthy lifestyle. We're talking about 3900 uh, BC. Some of the older people had arthritis, which indicates that most likely that people were being taken care of by other people. Uh, there's better tools. Now they don't have to take their tools with them so they could have larger tools at their campsite to process plants and, and animals and things like that. They start experimenting with baked clay. They haven't invented pottery yet, but they're sort of in the, the first steps. Uh, and then get to the next period. And what we see is that the permanent villages are probably somewhere else. And this area becomes kind of a deer butchering camp. So probably one of those mobile areas where they're hunting deer, processing it, and then bring it back to another place. So what we could see over the archaic is that people are going from large megafauna to then deer, fish, things like that. They are uh, mobile hunters and gatherers or foragers. Uh, because the climate has improved and there's so much food, they are allowed to settle in in one place permanently and they become collectors, settled or sedentary hunters and gatherers. All right, so a movement again from uh, mobile hunters and gatherers hunting megafauna to uh, mobile hunters and gatherers living in uh, temporary settlements that are only seasonally occupied. And you can see acorns and turkey to then sedentary hunting and gathering where they have a permanent village of, you know, five times the amount of uh, five times the size of the village when they were foragers. And they're going out and they're collecting and they're bringing those things back to the home base.